Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to Hazelwood Christian Church on this sunny Mother's Day. I have only two announcements today. Today is the last day to donate to Winnie's kids, as Winnie will be heading to Kenya this summer. We will present Winnie with a check next Sunday. As you can all imagine, everything she normally tries to collect for the children is costing more this year. So any assistance you can provide will have a positive effect in a part of the world that we could not reach on our own. Winnie is our messenger of love and generosity to these children. Also next Sunday, we will recognize our recent graduates and Jones Scholarship recipients. You will be proud of this group of young people. I am, and I hope you'll be here to honor them. We come each Sunday to worship together. Each of us brings with us from the past week our successes and failures, steps forward and steps back, concerns and joys. These are not visible to those around us, but they are known to our Heavenly Father. Take a breath, surrender all of it to him, and feel his peace as Lori begins our worship with the prelude, O love that will not let me go.
That feels like it needs an amen. (laughs) And now I invite you to join me in the call to worship. On this fourth Sunday of the Easter season, we have come to worship. And we are reminded that God is good and everything God makes is good. God is love, and everything God makes is born of that love. Let us live into the new life of which Easter reminds us. Let us continue to work towards equality for all of every gender, skin tone, and age. Happy Easter season. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And now I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious and holy Mother, Father, God, we are happy for those who have received special joys this week, and we ache for those who are facing difficult days of illness and loss. Today is a day full of emotions for many, With those who have just become or are about to become parents, we celebrate. With those who have lost beloved children, we mourn and ask for comfort. With those in the trenches with little ones every day, we empathize and ask for strength. With those who are longing to be parents, we feel the pain of their yearning and ask for solace. For those who are parents, step-parents, foster parents, grandparents, guardians, mentors, and spiritual guides, we give thanks for the supportive and meaningful roles they fill for those whom they nurture and love. For those who are separated from their children by distance, bad choices, or broken relationships, we pray for peace of heart and mind. With those who still have their parents close, we are grateful. With those who have lost their parents too soon, we grieve. With those who have close and loving relationships with their parents, we rejoice for those whose parents did not care for them as you intend, we ask for consolation. In all the varied situations of life in which we find ourselves this Mother's Day, we pray your spirit will be at work, weaving threads of goodness and light. Help us to live into the prayers we ask, Help us to live out our resurrection faith in service, offering peace and justice, hope and healing to all whom we meet. Help us to be agents of healing and mercy, of peace and love. We offer our lives and prayers in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and how lovely is his dwelling place, and we are here to worship him. So let us stand, if you would like, and join us in singing, Better Is One Day. one day in your house better is one day 
seated as we continue with our worship and singing hymn number 686 verses 1, 3, and 4. Children here this morning, they can join me. If I have any grown-ups that want to come up here, you are more than welcome. And I'd like to welcome all the children who are at home and watching today. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, Sam. Did you have a good week at school? 
Oh, we're doing I Learn Testing. Yeah, I know all about that. You have to go to the office. We won't tell anybody that. Okay. Well, so you did some testing, and I know I had to give that awful test. And it's and the why do you think they give that test? Why do you think they do it? To show what you learn and trying to see if you've grown throughout the year and to make you proud of yourself for what you've learned. That's kind of kind of why we do that. Well, today. We've also had another celebration last week. I don't know if you guys noticed. Did you guys have a teacher appreciation week last week? No, it was this week. This this past week, yeah. Both, both. both weeks, okay. So did you do something special for your teachers last week? No. All over the school gave them like they gave like a raffle and all sorts of stuff. Oh. Gave them like I mean, oh yeah, I mean my last day at the stuff. Okay, so the school gave them something to recognize, and that's neat. So, You drew, <laughs> you drew your teacher's face? That was neat. <laughs> OK. Well, what is today a special day to recognize? Mother's. Today is Mother's Day. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a day that we celebrate mothers and, and those who care for us. So this makes me wonder, can you think of ways that moms are like teachers, and like me, or teachers are like a mom? Can you think how they're kind of the same in a way? Okay, teachers let you know what's right and what's wrong. Okay, moms and dads, they do that too. That's a good answer. What are, what are, what are moms and teachers, what do they have the same? Can you think of anything? They can teach you how to cook. Yeah, they can teach you how to cook, okay. They can. They can teach you. Both of them can teach you how to read. And I think they both want to make sure that you're taken care of and that you're safe. Things like that. Those are kind of what things that moms and teachers have in common. Now, there's probably some other grown-ups in your life that are important to you. Um, do you have, like, grandparents that you see and, and take care of you? Maybe aunts and uncles, things like that? I mean, I do have to go to my own little park and see my grandma. Okay, good. So you see grandma and grandpa. I like that you call them that. That's kind of a neat name for it. I like that. When I was growing up, I remember I had my Aunt Betty and my Aunt Pat, and they always seemed to take good care of me, and I used to see them a lot. And then when I was growing up here at church, there was, we had a youth director named Mike, and he was really special to me, and he kind of took care of me and helped me when I had troubles and things like that. Well, grown-ups, part of what grown-ups do is we want to help all our children. We want to help them learn and grow, and we want to spend time with you and take care of you. And to do that, we are sort of showing and living out God's love. God wants us all to love one another, especially for grown-ups to take good care of the children in our lives. And it's good to have days like this, where we take time to say thank you to the people who love us and the people who take care of us. So this morning at the Young Disciples table in the back, you might have noticed there's something a little different we have some thank you coloring sheets back there. And you can give those to anybody in your life that you want to just thank for helping to take care of you and to help making you a better person than the person that you are right now. All right, let's have a prayer together. Well, that's good, Sam. I bet your mom really liked it. Our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for earthly parents and other grown-ups who love and care for children. We help all children grow up in safe places with grown-ups who will help them learn and grow. Help all grown-ups to show your love to the children in their lives. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. In Genesis 5, we read these words in verses 1 and 2. On the day God created humanity, God made them to resemble God and created them male and female. God blessed them and called them humanity on the day they were created. 
What follows these words in that chapter is actually a rather dull listing of some of the names of the descendants of that first human couple, tracing all the way down to Noah. But these words at the very beginning of the chapter, like the ones they echo from Genesis 1.27, are foundational in our understanding of humans' relationship with God and with one another. Or at least they should be. You would have had to have grown up under a rock to not know that women have historically not always been treated equally with men, which is unfortunately an issue that is still very much alive in the present day. When I was in seminary, I learned a lot about how scripture has been distorted throughout the years to subjugate women. And the intersection of Christianity with sexism and racism was the topic of my final capstone research paper. I could literally talk about this topic for hours, but not to worry, you will get out of here in time for your lunch plans. As I was contemplating how to craft a sermon that celebrates the equality of women as God intended, I decided, rather than trying to cover so much of what is here in my head and my heart, that I would just focus on one woman who was an integral part of Jesus's ministry. That is Mary, from the town of Magdala, from which we get the name Magdalene, used to distinguish her from all the other Marys that we find in scripture. This Mary was one of several women who financially supported the ministry of Jesus. We know that in that time period, even as today, uh, that women were often at the mercy of the men in their lives to financially provide for them. But these women evidently had funds which they controlled, whether through marriage or by inheritance, so that they were able to provide for Jesus' ministry. I can't help but wonder, like, what if they hadn't? Fortunately, they did. And they also regularly traveled with him, often simply referred to as the women or and other women. We know that Mary Magdalene was not the only one, but she was the most prominent woman in Jesus' ministry. In Luke 8, we are introduced to Mary Magdalene with these words in verses 1 through 3. (coughs) Jesus traveled through the cities and villages, preaching and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. Excuse me. The twelve were with him, along with some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Among them were Mary Magdalene from whom seven demons had been thrown out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's servant Husa. Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Her name is probably already familiar to you as Mary Magdalene was featured prominently in all four gospel accounts of the resurrection, which we heard read on Easter morning just a few weeks ago. You may also recall from your previous studies that she is also present in each of the four crucifixion accounts found in the Gospels. What you may not know is that we also have other ancient writings that identify Mary Magdalene as the apostle to the apostles, the one who provided wise counsel and leadership to the twelve as they embarked on new ministries after Jesus' ascension. But Mary Magdalene's history, like so many women in history, her history has been distorted and her reputation maligned. As the early church grew more institutional after the original apostles died, the role of women in the Christian movement began to be discounted. And Mary of Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, 
Elizabeth's identity was confused with other unnamed women in the Gospels. And eventually, she is converted from a figure who once challenged misogynistic stereotypes to one who confirms them, as she is fictitiously rendered as a penitent prostitute. How did this happen? Well, that's kind of a long story that I'm going to try to shorten. James Carroll, writing for the Smithsonian in 2006, makes a really good point when he says that it helps us to have some chronology in mind with a focus on the place of women in the Jesus movement. What he calls phase one is the time of Jesus himself. And there is every reason to believe that, according to his teaching, and his circle, women were uniquely empowered as fully equal. He was certainly making things new for women. Then there's phase two, when the norms and assumptions of the Jesus community were being written down. The equality of women is is reflected in the letters of St. Paul, who names women as full partners, his partners, in the Christian movement. Additionally, we have the gospel accounts that were preserved in writing, which give evidence of Jesus' own attitudes and highlight women whose courage and fidelity stand in marked contrast to the men's cowardice. But Carol says by phase three, that is after the gospels are written, but before the New Testament is defined as such, Jesus' rejection of the prevailing male dominance was being eroded in the Christian community. The Gospels themselves, written in those several decades after Jesus, can be read to suggest this erosion was already beginning because of their emphasis on the authority of the Twelve, who were all men, making the times women are included quite noticeable. Here it is useful to recall not only how the Second Testament scriptures were composed, but also how they were selected as being scripture. The holy books of Christianity were established by a complicated process conducted by fallible humans. You see, the explosive spread of the good news of Jesus meant that distinct Christian communities were springing up all over the place. There was a lively diversity of belief and practice which was reflected in the oral traditions and later the written texts from which these communities drew upon. In other words, there were many other writings that could have been included in the canon. That is, the body of writings determined to be sacred scripture. But they were not. It was not until the fourth century that the list of canonized books we now know as the Second Testament or New Testament it was established by a group of all men. The fourth century is also significant because that is when Christianity became entwined with government and power, and the church moved even more towards mirroring within the institution the norms of the Roman Empire under the rule of Emperor Constantine. It was an empire of hierarchy and patriarchy, which the institutional church emulated within itself, thinking that this was a good means of survival. Meanwhile, one of the most important Christian texts to be found outside the official canon is the Gospel of Mary, according to many scholars. This gospel is a telling of the Jesus movement that features Mary Magdalene as one of the most important and powerful leaders. Just as the canonical gospels emerged from communities that associated themselves with certain early church leaders and their teachings, who did not themselves write the Gospels, this one is named for Mary not because she wrote it, but because it emerged from a community that recognized her authority. Whether through suppression or neglect, the Gospel of Mary was lost in the early period. 
just as the real Mary Magdalene was beginning to disappear into the fictitious, mythical persona. And as women were disappearing, because they were barred, from the church's inner circle. Although Jesus rejected male dominance as symbolized in his commissioning of Mary Magdalene to spread the news of the resurrection, male dominance gradually made a powerful comeback within the Jesus movement. In the year 591, Pope Gregory did not do any careful study as he too conflated disparate stories of unnamed women and assigned them all to Mary Magdalene in a series of sermons addressed to his brethren. James Carroll summarizes the effect of Gregory's misinterpretation this way. An endless succession of preachers would treat Gregory's reading as literally the gospel truth. Holy Writ, having recast what had actually taken place in the lifetime of Jesus, was itself recast. The men of the church who benefited from this recasting forever spared the presence of females in their sanctuaries would not know that this is what has happened. Having created a myth, they would not remember that it was mythical. Their Mary Magdalene, a composite betrayal of a once venerated woman, became the only Mary Magdalene that had ever existed in their minds. Even though biblical scholars have repeatedly verified that Mary was not a prostitute, and many preachers long before me, including male preachers, have um, tried to clarify this, that she was not a prostitute nor an adulterous woman, you will still find some preachers preaching that she was. You will still find misleading um, online articles conflating unnamed women as being Mary Magdalene. And today, you will still find memes circulating on Facebook that repeat these untruths. And still today, we see women being judged by their sexuality rather than being seen as made equally to resemble God. Mary Magdalene is just one example of women whose important historical role has been erased or distorted. On this day that celebrates mothering, it is the job of all of us, whether mothers or not, whether male or female, to help the children in our lives know that they are all made in the image of God, as are all people. And that God empowers girls and women, not just men and boys, to be leaders and trailblazers. Unfortunately, there are still many churches today where only men can be leaders and pastors and who continue to teach that women are inferior to men and use Bible verses taken out of context to justify this teaching, even brainwashing women to also believe it is God's will. Fortunately, there are congregations that are filled with men who do respect and value the talents and contributions of women. And Hazelwood is one of them. Children here can grow up seeing both men and women serve and filling all leadership roles without restrictions based on their gender. Praise God. I don't know about you, but have you ever had a week where you just feel like you're not feeling anything? You just feel like life is just passing you by and you feel numb. Or maybe you have a week where you feel weak and you just can't stand against the storms of life. Or maybe you have a week where you're falling short. Mothers <laughs> taking care of kids, trying to provide for them. Many of you may feel this way as well. But we need to believe, you and I need to believe, that God says that you are loved, you are strong, and you are held.
every single lie that tells me I will never measure Just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. come now to this time of communion. We come together to share of the elements representing his blood and body. So let us come and share the Lord. If you'd like to stand and join us as we sing our communion hymn number 408, and we'll be singing it all.
So Jesus is making all things new. He is helping to break down barriers. He is helping to break down gender stereotypes. And men, this is not just good news for women. This is good news for men too. Because if there's not a narrow definition of what a woman's purpose is and how a woman is supposed to act, then there's also not a narrow definition for men's purpose and how men are supposed to act. It's okay. It's good for men to be nurturers, to be caring. Those are not just feminine traits. Those are people traits. And Jesus modeled this with his very life. And it was on the night when he was about to be betrayed, knowing what lay ahead, he took that bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. When you eat of it, remember me. And in like manner, after the meal, he took the common cup. And he said, this is a sign of the new covenant. My blood shed for you. When you drink of it, remember me. And so it is throughout all those years From the early church to this day, we do indeed. Whenever we partake of this bread and cup or whatever elements we're using at home to represent them, we do indeed remember the life, the teachings, the birth, and the resurrection of Christ. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we are members of your family gathered in this sanctuary surrounded by the familiar faces of people we know and love. As we come to your table, we rejoice in this sense of being a family, of breaking bread together. But we know that your family goes beyond these walls. When we break bread here, we also break bread with people from every nation who are one in Christ. Help us to be sensitive to their needs, their hopes, their fears, even as we are to one another. Your cup has been raised, blessed and shared, 
as the outpouring love of Christ. Alone, we are weak and fragmented. But when we gather around this table, receiving the blessing of your spirit, we form a chain of great strength. Let us use this strength, mutual encouragement, and dedication to your will, a chain of love in which your power is made perfect in our weakness. Now as we come before you, we offer the prayer that your most precious son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, where you are invited to come forward, the elders will have these two trays that um, will have the um, cup on the top. This, you take a double stack, you lift the, the drink cup, take your bread, and then drink your juice. And then there are um, usually deacons where you can return your cups. But uh, take your cups back to your seat this week. No? Oh, they're going to put them in the trays this week. It threw me off because they weren't baskets. All right. So welcome to the table. people say that uh, they don't like churches because all they do, they just want your money but we know that that is not true uh, although there are some churches where they will try to tell you exactly how much you should be giving but it's not a social club with dues that you have to pay what we offer here this this 
time to worship and other ministries throughout the week are available regardless if you ever contribute a dime or not. But hopefully, if you do value the ministry of this congregation, you do want to give, whether through financial resources, through your time, through your talent, through your prayers, through your sphere of influence, you want to see this ministry continue, and you give with a grateful and joyful heart. For those of you giving financially, you may do so at the um, offering plates in the back, through the U.S. mail, or through the Giveify app online. Let us pray. that you have given us to come here and serve for the opportunity to broadcast online. Thank you for everything. We know that everything that you give us, we have given, and we want to give back to you. Please take what we give you and multiply it for your good and for your favor to continue to work in your kingdom. We ask this in your sweet and holy name. Amen. go about our week, let us remember that we worship the beautiful one. Let's stand if you'd like and join us in singing as I play the right key for the song. So 
May our eyes continue to be opened anew to the ways of God and know that as you leave this time of worship, you go with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>